Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, June 18th, 2023, and we are live. Call in numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. Well, it is uh, Juneteenth time uh, again, and we're going to deal with some Juneteenth history and dispel some myths uh, about Juneteenth as well. I've been seeing news stories, uh, stories in the media, uh, stories on MSNBC, uh, dealing with Juneteenth. And even though Juneteenth can, can become a powerful celebration and a powerful tool that we use to teach history, economics, law, and, po and, and politics, to our people and give America the massive history lesson that it needs because Americans are very ignorant of history. Um, a lot of this information floating around dealing with Juneteenth is uh, inaccurate. So we're going to deal with uh, Juneteenth myths. Uh, it's a federal holiday. Now what? correcting the history and, co and protecting the history and also understanding how to utilize Juneteenth to help in the fight for repairing the damage of a legacy of, uh, of slavery, 246 years of slavery, decades of Jim Crow segregation, redlining, housing discrimination, discrimination coming to uh, when it comes to education, bank loans, et cetera. OK, so how do we use Juneteenth? To help in the fight for reparations and also contrary to popular belief contrary to what you hear in a lot of media sources um june 19th 1865 was not the last day of slavery june 19th 1865 was not the last day of slavery in the u.s either okay so we'll discuss uh that uh topic today now also uh early in the week um a some viral news stories, and I hate to use the word news, but viral news stories were floating around saying that um, media mogul Tyler Perry had purchased uh, BET, okay, Black Entertainment Television. Now, we know early in the year, Forbes.com um, had an article saying that uh, uh, Tyler Perry was interested in purchasing BET. And then also we saw articles. Uh, originally, there was an article from um, the Wall Street Journal that talked about uh, BET being for sale. And then we uh, also heard that uh, Byron Allen was interested in buying BET also. OK, but there was this viral story that has been circulating around. Uh, there's been a bunch of social media memes saying that Tyler Perry has actually purchased BET, okay? Now, I did a, a broadcast back on June 15th, 2023, dispelling this myth and going through, show, showing why these memes, why these articles floating around are false. And then in the last two or three days, there have been more articles that uh, have come out saying there's no evidence that he purchased BET, okay? So I'm going to share some of that information with you uh, as well. And we have to look at this information with a critical eye and follow the trail of evidence. The source article, which is from an unknown website called streamer.com, was removed days ago, okay? And people are still putting this misinformation out. So we'll talk about uh, some Juneteenth history and dispelling myths about Juneteenth. We'll talk about Tyler Perry as well. Then uh, I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered on uh, Friday, uh, June 16th. And attorney Areva Martin was on. Uh, no, I was on uh, Thursday, June 15th. I was on Thursday instead of Friday because I was speaking out in Mount Clemens at the Carnes Community Center uh, Friday, June 16th for... Uh, for Juneteenth. So I had to do Roland's show on Thursday instead of Friday. So I was on and um, attorney Reva Martin from Los Angeles was on the show. And we discussed 
um, a Palm Spring, a Palm Springs neighborhood uh, where black and Latino families were displaced in the 1950s and 1960s. OK, they were displaced in the 1950s and 1960s and their homes uh, were bulldozed, their homes destroyed. And they're suing the city of uh, Palm Springs. And it's a section in the city uh, called uh, Section 14. They're suing for $2.3 billion, okay? They're suing for $2.3 billion. Um, there's an article from the Associated Press uh, dealing with this, and attorney Reva Martin, who is uh, an attorney on behalf of some of the families, she uh, was on Roland Martin and Filter, and she discussed this also. So we're going to uh, discuss that topic. And this also deals with repairing the damage of a legacy of slavery as well. Okay. And we know that there has been a massive uh, theft of land that African Americans owned. Um, throughout the decades. Okay, so we'll discuss that topic. And then um, Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida is at it again. Uh, he just recently cut funding for uh, black history programs uh, in Florida. News1.com has an article dealing with that. Ahead of Juneteenth, Ron DeSantis slashes funding four black history programs in Florida. Okay. Just in time for Juneteenth, Ron DeSantis slashes uh, black history month programs, uh, funding for black history month programs in Florida. And I just have to echo the words of governor. Um, um, just have to echo the words of um, Andrew Gillum when he was running for a uh, governor he said, I'm not saying Mr. DeSantis is a racist. I'm saying the racists uh, believe that Mr. DeSantis is a racist. OK, so we'll talk about those topics and more. And also we'll give you a preview of uh, we have a brand new class starting up um, a 12 week online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. OK. And you can register for that right now at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. This class is going to be on Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Class number one uh, starts up on uh, Saturday, uh, June 24th. OK, so this is a 12 week online class that I teach you. There were thousands of years of history and what leads up to. Uh, the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. You can register for that class right now. And we have bonus content you can start watching. I'll be doing a uh, preview of the class on Monday. So you can uh, join us for that as well. All right, now on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct your own behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you control the covers of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we do with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events in history, politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Give us a call. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. Um and uh, you can and have you been to any Juneteenth uh, celebrations uh, this uh, Juneteenth season? If so, uh, you give us a call. Let us know uh, what you thought about them. How were they? Where, where were they? And what have you learned about Juneteenth this year that you didn't already know about Juneteenth? I'm just curious to find out. Uh, there was a, a study done and there was a study that came out. Uh, there's an article from. 
uh, the New York Times. New York Times had a good article dealing with uh, how most Americans know little or nothing uh, about Juneteenth. OK, how most Americans uh, know little or nothing about Juneteenth. And uh, this uh, study came out in 2021. There was an article from uh, June 16th, 2021, dealing uh, with this. Let's take a look at this here from New York Times. And we know that um, we know that Juneteenth uh, became a federal holiday in uh, June 17th, 2021, when it passed Congress and was signed into law by uh, President Joe Biden. OK, so let me uh, pull up this article here. Just a second. Call the numbers 313-778-7600 if you have a question or comment. All right. Most Americans know little or nothing about Juneteenth poll fines. Most Americans know little or nothing about Juneteenth poll fines. Academics believe the, that increases in the number of people familiar with the holiday, which commemorates the uh, end of slavery in the U.S., may be a result of last summer's protest against racism. So we know May 25th, 2020, uh, we know George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis, Minnesota by, by Derek Chauvin. And then we also know around that same time, Breonna Taylor was killed and there were massive protests in the street and around the world. So the next uh, that next month was June and a lot of people started celebrating Juneteenth who didn't celebrate it before, didn't know it existed. Uh, according to this article from The New York Times, uh, more than 60 percent of Americans know nothing at all or only a little bit about Juneteenth, the holiday celebrating the end of slavery in the United States, according to a new Gallup poll. The 37 percent of respondents who reported having a lot or some knowledge of the holiday may be an increase from previous years. We'll continue this on the other side of the break and we'll con uh, we'll deal with some uh dispelling some myths about Juneteenth. It was not the last day of slavery and the Emancipation Proclamation did not free the slaves. You listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel, 9, 10 a.m. WFDF. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right, stand by, everybody. Share this broadcasting on social media platforms. We invite your friends to tune in. Stand by. I have to get ready for this next segment. How's everybody doing? That is broadcasting your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in. Stand by. Back from breaking two minutes. Back for breaking one minute, everybody. Stand by.
Back from break in one minute. Fiction. Grand Eggman is what you want. 9, 10 a.m. is what you need. I'm your host of the Mike M. Hotel. On the After History Network show, we focus on educating and empowering and inspiring people of African descent to lock it down for and around the world. A lot of people don't know what the hell they're talking about. They may have their areas of expertise, but some people need to learn how to stay in their own lane. If you don't know, just say you don't know. So we have a lot to talk about, so we're going to jump right into this. Catch it all right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation WFDF. Call in numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. Okay, right before the break, we were talking about some Juneteenth history and how a little more than 60% of Americans know very little or nothing at all uh, about Juneteenth. OK. And there are uh, a number of myths uh, floating around uh, about Juneteenth also. OK, so we're going to dispel uh, those myths here on the show today and give you some sources so we can uh, Juneteenth can become a very powerful uh, celebration, a very powerful holiday if we incorporate history, law, economics, and politics into the celebrations. It can't just uh, be uh, African-Americans having a cookout or, um, you know, having frivolity, things of this nature. It has to, it, we have to add some purpose to it. We have to add um, history lessons. We have to deal with economic empowerment, deal with politics, all of that add that to uh the juneteenth uh celebration okay all right now i want to go back to this article here from uh the new york times which dealt with this came out in this article came out june 2021 but it dealt with how uh 60 percent of americans know very uh know uh little or nothing at all about juneteenth little or nothing at all about juneteenth and America must have a massive history lesson, okay? Especially if we think that we're going to get any type of reparations, repairing the damage of a legacy of dec uh, 246 years of slavery and decades of systemic races, racism, et cetera. America must have a massive history lesson. Um, and one of the reasons why Juneteenth is so important is because it forces a national conversation about a history that Republicans are passing laws in state legislatures to suppress the teaching of that history in school. This is this is one of the reasons why Juneteenth uh, is so important and can become very powerful if we use it correctly. All right. So this article from the New York Times, most Americans know little or nothing uh, about Juneteenth. Poll finds. Uh, so the article goes on to say uh, the survey, the results of which were released. Um, so this came out in June 2021, found that nearly half of the people surveyed supported teaching the history of Juneteenth in public schools. There was less support, 35 percent, for making June 19th a federal holiday, but only a quarter of respondents said they were opposed to the idea. All right. So read the rest of this article here. Uh, this is from the New York Times. OK, now, if we look quickly here. At some history dealing with uh, June 19th, uh, Juneteenth, 1865, uh, th there's a good article from uh, blackpast.org, blackpast.org called uh, Juneteenth, the growth of an American holiday, Juneteenth, the growth of, a, of an American holiday. OK, and. June 19th, 1865, commemorates when Major General Gordon Granger goes into Galveston, Texas, to deliver what's known as General Order Number Three. Now, a lot of the news media says 
Uh, this is when African Americans in Texas got the word that they were free, and they say it was two and a half uh, years after the Emancipation Proclamation, and they give you the impression that all the enslaved Africans in Galveston, Texas, found out on one day that they were free. Okay, all that's false. All that is false. Here's why it's false. All right, so uh, Texas was a safe haven for uh, slave owners during the Civil War. Civil War is 1861 to 1865. So you're going to have um, slaveholders from surrounding states, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, things like this, Georgia, who are going to take their uh, enslaved Africans into Texas because Texas was more far removed from uh, major battles in the Civil War and they had much less of a Union presence in the state of Texas. Isolated from both Union and Confederate forces, during the Civil War and thus spar uh, spared horrific battles on its soil, Texas has become a place of refuge for slaveholders seeking to ensure that their property, their enslaved Africans, would not hear of freedom. Through April, May, and part of June 1865, largely they did, they did not, although some did. Now, I'm, I'm going to show you an article from, from uh, P. Uh, Pinio Joseph, uh, who's a historian, he has a really good article uh, in Texas Monthly, texasmonthly.com. The story we've been told about Juneteenth is wrong. That article came out uh, June 4th, 2023. So finally, on June 19th, 1865, freedom officially arrives in Texas. Uh, one day before, on June 18th, Union uh, General Gordon Granger and 2,000 federal troops, most of them African-American men, uh, landed on the beach at Galveston and take control of the last unoccupied Confederate state. The following day on June 19th, uh, General Gordon Granger uh, read the comments of General Order Number 3 from the balcony of the Ashton Villa in Galveston, Texas. His proclamation announced in part, now, Anytime we talk about these documents, Emancipation Proclamation, U.S. Constitution, we talk about General Order Number Three, or we talk about Special Field Order Number Fifteen, uh, ostensibly known as Forty Acres and a Mule. It's important to actually go and read all of these documents. Okay, this is something that I said in Mount Clemens at the Carnes Community Center, and shout out to uh, uh, Malia Howard of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, and the uh, Zetas out there. Uh, Mount Clemens chapter of Zeta Phi Beta because they organized this event and they had me speak there. So what we hear in the media is this first portion of general order number three. The people of Texas are informed. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, which was Abraham Lincoln, even though this is after Lincoln's assassinated. Lincoln is, is shot April 14th, 1865 at the Ford Theater. He dies the next morning at 722 a.m. So this is in June. OK, so this is uh, two months after Lincoln is assassinated. Proclamation from the executive of the United States. All slaves are free. All slaves are free. Now. Most of what we hear in the media surrounding general order number three, they stop there. That's not all that it said. It goes on to say this involves an absolute equality of personal rights and property rights between former masters and slaves and the connection heretofore existing between them. Now, this is an important part between them becomes that between employer and hired labor employer and hired labor meaning that the enslaved africans weren't supposed to leave the plantations and go seek a new life they were supposed to stay on the plantations and and, and work out wages with their former slave owners okay this is in general order number three it goes on to say the freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages the freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages well for some of them maybe they can get fair wages but mm, 
some of these slave owners weren't too nice. So it's like, okay, so we are gonna work out fair wages with the same people that enslaved our families for decades and and uh, sexually violated possibly our mothers and daughters, and we we gonna work out wages. It's, uh, for some it may have worked out, but for some others it it did that didn't that didn't work out too well. Okay, it goes on to say, General Henry goes on to say they are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and that they will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere meaning you can't just loiter you can't be a vagrant you can't just hang out on the street corner or something like that okay uh you need to go and seek wages with your former masters now this is general order number three now yes there were celebrations when these enslaved africans got the news that they were free because of general order number three now the u.s constitution has not been amended at this point it's not until the u.s constitution is amendment december 6 1865 that chattel slavery officially ends okay that's what officially ends chattel slavery uh when the emancipation uh, the the uh, the emancipation proclamation did not free the enslaved africans why didn't the emancipation proclamation free the enslaved africans that's a very good question Here's why. This is why it's important to read all these documents. And in my online classes, we get deep into these documents and we study this history. So this article here is from history.com, official website of the History Channel called What is Juneteenth? What is Juneteenth? And we look here at the, uh, they talk about the Emancipation Proclamation. And uh, it, it deals with, it talks about how the Emancipation Proclamation issued by Abraham Lincoln uh, January 1st, 1863, established that all enslaved people in the Confederate states in rebellion against the Union shall be then thenceforward and forever free. OK, but in reality, the Emancipation Proclamation did not instantly free any enslaved people. We'll deal with this on the other side of the break. Let's the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by, everybody. Back from breaking four minutes. How's everybody doing? All right. So if you like this type of information, register for uh, the online classes that I teach because uh, we get deep into this history in the online classes. Also, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. We have the information around the homepage of our website for uh, class for class number one. It's going to start up Saturday, um, June 24th. OK, stand by. I'm going to post the link here also. How's everybody doing? Uh, so post your comments here. We give you a shout out here on the air. Back from break in three minutes. Also, my Juneteenth lectures are available at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. We have them in uh, DVD format and digital download format. Stand by. Okay. You can support the African History Network, uh, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App dollar sign the ahn show through cash app also through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show we're going to post that information here also okay so we have uh smitty rock uh we have lawrence uh bradford ross watching uh chris wilson just a few people watching Okay, back from break in two minutes. Back from break in two minutes.
All right, back from break in one minute, everybody. Stand by. It is what you want. 9, 10 a.m. is what you need. I'm your host, Brother Michael in the hotel. On the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. A lot of people don't know what the hell they're talking about. They may have their areas of expertise, but some people need to learn how to stay in their own lane. If you don't know, just say you don't know. So we have a lot to talk about, so we're going to jump right into this. Catch it all right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 910 AM Superstation or Adele Media. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation WFDF. Call in numbers 313 313- seven seven eight seventy six hundred three one three seven seven eight seventy six hundred is the call in number if you have a question or comment all right uh before we get back to this information dealing with juneteenth a uh, couple things i need to let you know uh number one on monday june 19th i will be out in inkster michigan um i'll be at uh inkster park for the uh, Juneteenth Middle Passage Memorial. Um, and I'll be speaking there. So the the whole event is 1 p.m. to uh, 9 p.m. We have the information right on the homepage of our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. So the whole event is 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. at Inkster Park, located at 1550 John Daly Road, D-A-L-Y, John Daly Road in Inkster, Michigan. It's inside the park. It's a very small park. It's under the pavilion, under the pavilion. Okay, the event is 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. It's free and open to the public. I speak at 7 p.m. I'll speak for about a half hour to an hour or so. Uh, probably they told me I can go up to an hour, so we'll take questions. And I'm going to do a Juneteenth history and the fight for reparations, all this, tie all this history together. Okay. And I'll have my DVD lectures out there and register people for our online classes. We have the information right on the homepage of our website. And for more information, call 734 444 5765, 734 444 5765, or call 313 313- um 207 4527 4527 uh with uh, uh if you have any uh questions okay but we have the information around the home page of our website the african history network.com now also uh my 12 week online course and i've been teaching this class on and off since 2017 ancient kemet one of the original names for egypt ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school class number one is going to be uh saturday june 24th 2 p.m to 4 p.m eastern standard time it's on sale 80 dollars regular 130 dollars click right here to uh, register for the full course as soon as you register there's bonus content that you can watch and we have some uh, free lectures of, of mine that are uploaded into the video library the information is PG-13, so you can use this with your children also. Okay, uh, I want to go back to this article here from history.com, then we'll go to the phone lines quickly. Uh, this is called, What is Juneteenth? Okay, history.com is the official website of the History Channel. Now, it talks about how, and we deal with this in my, in my online classes, how the Emancipation Proclamation did not legally free the enslaved Africans. Uh, the, the Emancipation Proclamation only applied to places under Confederate control, uh, uh, only the territories in rebellion, uh, in the, in the border states that still held slaves like Maryland, Missouri, Kentucky, and Delaware, they were allowed to keep their slaves. So Kentucky 
and uh, like Kentucky and Delaware, they don't abolish slavery until December 6, 1865, when the 13th Amendment is ratified. Maryland does not abolish slavery until uh, November 1st, 1864. It's November 1st, 1864, when uh, Maryland uh, abolishes slavery and they had to put it on the ballot and it almost uh, it almost did not pass. OK, so the 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 territories in rebellion had seceded from the union and set up their own government. So the union had no authority to dictate to them to do anything. OK, so they didn't have the authority to free their slaves. Now, the Emancipation Proclamation is going to be important. The reason why is, is because it changes the trajectory of the Civil War. The Civil War was originally fought to bring the South back into the Union. Uh, the, the You have 11 states that secede from the Union, starting with South Carolina, December 20th, 1860, about six weeks after Abraham Lincoln becomes president-elect, and these Southern states think that Lincoln is going to free the slaves. So after the Emancipation Proclamation, the purpose of the war changes to freeing the slaves as opposed to keeping the union together all right now is going to so it's going to lead to you know the 13th amendment being ratified things like this but the emancipation proclamation did not free the slaves now there are 250,000 enslaved africans in texas okay all of them don't get the news on june 19th of general order number three and that the civil war is over for all practical purposes the civil war is over okay we know that the civil war is going to go on until uh technically until august of 1866 all right and the reason why is um uh, april 9th 1865 general robert e lee surrenders to uh ulysses says grant at appomattox courthouse okay so General Robert E. Lee's army of Northern Virginia was the largest Confederate army, but it was not the only Confederate army. All right. And, uh, you know, I teach a class of black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution to the U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement and Black Power Movement, 1800 to 1968. And we get deep into all of this history. So if we look at this article here from History dot com. Uh, why the Civil War was actually what why the Civil War actually ended 16 months after Lee surrendered. It's not going to be until August 1866 that President Andrew uh, Johnson is going to declare uh, a formal end to the Civil War. And the reason why is because uh, terms of surrender had to be negotiated with the other generals of the Confederacy. OK, so there were smaller armies like General Joseph E. Johnston's army of tennessee who had the second second largest confederate army after general robert e lee's you had um you had a uh, general nathan bedford forrest also of tennessee you had his army he goes on to be the first grand wizard of the ku klux klan in 1867 all right so terms of surrender had to be negotiated with each one of these uh generals okay so read this article here from history.com uh why the civil war actually she ended 16 months after uh, Lee surrendered. Okay, so if we go back to uh, the uh, this other one here, what is Juneteenth? It, it goes on to talk about how uh, the year following 1865, freedmen in Texas organized the first of what became uh, the annual of what became the annual celebration of Jubilee Day, Jubilee Day on June 19th. So before it's Juneteenth, it's called Jubilee Day. In the ensuing decades, Juneteenth commemorate the uh, commemorations featured music, barbecues, prayer services and other activities. Now, keep in mind that Juneteenth is taking place in the month of June, which is also Black Music Month. So we're going to incorporate music into our celebrations, but we also need to incorporate the history of music and how we use music to, to communicate messages and how music fueled our movements like the Civil Rights Movement and the Black Power Movement and how we use music as a tool of liberation and negative corporate controlled hip hop has been co-opted and it's been is being used as a tool of uh, uh, subjugation and the tool to destroy the minds of African people, especially our youth. So so all this gets flipped around on us. OK, now in, in 1979, Texas became the first state 
to make Juneteenth an official holiday, several others followed suit over the years. In June 2021, Congress passed a resolution establishing Juneteenth as a federal holiday. President Joe Biden signed it into law on June 17, 2021. But there were many African-Americans who fought for decades to get Juneteenth to become a federal holiday. One of them is named Opal Lee, O-P-A-L, Opal Lee, African-American uh, woman, former uh, uh, former school teacher, also a member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. So uh, oftentimes we give uh, white people too, many, uh, too, too much credit for accomplishments that we did. That came about because of, of, of dedicated African-Americans fighting for decades to get this to become a federal holiday. And this is the only federal holiday, only federal holiday that recognizes slavery. Okay. And we have to use Juneteenth as a tool to educate America on history and the history of slavery and also the need for repairing the damage of a legacy of slavery as well. So one of the reasons why Juneteenth is so can, can be a powerful tool if we understand and infuse into it history, economics, law, and politics is because Juneteenth forces into the national conversation a history that Republicans are passing laws and state, state legislatures to ban the teaching of this history. OK, and also they're passing laws to uh, they're, they're, they're banning books at, at the school board level because they've hijacked like groups like Moms uh, Moms for Liberty, things like this. These right wing groups, they've hijacked uh, school boards and politicized school boards. So they're banning books. A lot of them are by African-American authors and tied to the uh, civil rights movement, uh, black power movement, slavery, etc. When we come back, we're going to go to the phone lines. We'll go to uh, uh, Rashidi. And then also I want to uh, look briefly at this article here from Penio uh, Joseph. The story we've been told about Juneteenth is wrong. Listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by, back from break in one minute. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on social media platforms. Back from break in four minutes. Uh, you can support the African History Network. If you like this type of information, if you're learning anything here uh, today, you can support us, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. The so says keep doing the research, stay on the air, buy equipment, pay some of the bills, etc. Keep broadcasting the show. Uh, let's see here. Let's post this here. Okay, so we're gonna post information about the uh, show, and I will be in Inkster, Michigan on Monday at Inkster Park for the Juneteenth uh, Middle Passage uh, celebration commemoration. Stand by. Okay, back from break in two minutes. Okay. Rainy Fox Media said exactly. Smitty Rock said uh, very important and critical info for the historical record. Stand by. Back from breaking one minute.
station, the oldest radio station in town since 1922. And great programming. When it's what you want, 9, 10 a.m. is what you need. I'm your host for the Michael and Hotel. On the After History Network show, we focus on educating and empowering and inspiring people of African descent who are to die for and around the world. A lot of people don't know what the hell they're talking about. They may have their areas of expertise, but some people need to learn how to stay in their own lane. If you don't know, just say you don't know. So we have a lot to talk about, so we're going to jump right into this. Catch it all right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstition. <laughs> Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, uh, WFDF. Okay, calling numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. Okay, now, if we look at this here and then we're going to the phone lines, um, let, let's go to the phone lines and then we'll go to some of your comments here on uh social media okay we have kwame on line one hey kwame welcome to the african history network show uh thanks for holding tell us where you're calling from uh detroit okay you, you know a group that does not know that they're free the only thing worse than that is the general that, that that does not know that the king is over <laughs> And, and I mean, say, say, say that again. This guy, uh, 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 you know, Kwame, 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 repeat uh, what you just said. The only thing that's worse than uh, a group that doesn't know that they're free is a general that doesn't know that civil war killing is over. This general kept killing after uh, the war was over. He became the, the leader of the, the, uh, the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux oh, Klan. in Bedford Forest? Yeah, you know, whatever it was. But the point is, is that that's what the police do to about. They're still fighting the Civil War, including the chances. Okay, all right. Okay. Yeah, the is... I mean, is, see, uh, man, so I, mean, I, I, I learned so many things. See, I knew that thousands oh, of black oh, 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 people oh, 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 were killed in reconstruction. Oh, 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 and I, I really didn't know... Kwame, I actually know why, can you hear me? but now I understand why. Kwame, can you hear me? Okay. All right. Thanks for calling. Okay. Let's continue here. Okay. okay let's continue. All right. Uh, I want to go to this article here from, uh, this is from Texas Monthly. And the name of this article is the story we've been told about Juneteenth is wrong. The story we've been told about Juneteenth is wrong. Now, I'm going to go to page three here for the sake of time. Uh, General Gordon Granger's order was based loosely on Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. The 13th Amendment, which made slavery unconstitutional, was not ratified until December 6, 1865. The order, General Order Number 3, first declared that the formerly enslaved were free based on absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between black people and those who have presumed legal ownership of them. This is the happy news upon which most Juneteenth celebrations are based. It's an oversimplified tale of what happened that day. It's a oversimplified tale of what happened that day. When we have these Juneteenth celebrations, we have to deal with the accurate history. And at the same time, People of different races and ethnicities can come to the Juneteenth celebrations. They can patronize African-American-owned businesses. But we cannot water down the history to make white people feel comfortable with the oppression of African-Americans. We have to use Juneteenth as a tool to educate, one, African-Americans on this history, not just June 19th, but what happened prior to that. And after that, during the Reconstruction era, 1865, 1877, which then leads to the Jim Crow era and leads to a reversal of gains that we were making during the Reconstruction era, getting uh, elected to public office, uh, acquiring land, getting education, 
things of this nature. We know that you're going to have the Mississippi State Convention of 1890, which imposes rewrites the state constitution, imposes poll taxes and literacy tests to suppress the African-American vote. Um, Solomon Saladin Calhoun, who was the white county judge who presided over the Mississippi State Convention, he said, we came here to exclude the Negro. We came here to exclude the Negro. Now, this is in uh, the state of Mississippi. And Mississippi had the most number of lynchings from 1882 to 1968. But also Mississippi, the majority of the population in Mississippi were African-Americans. OK, and that's a, as a, as a legacy of slavery. Then you're going to have other states that do the same thing. What, what Mississippi did became known as the Mississippi plan, the Mississippi plan. OK, and uh, you, you, you have uh, uh, South Carolina in South Carolina in uh, 1895 and Louisiana 1898. Uh, they're going to do uh, the same thing to impose poll taxes and literacy tests. And, and, and then the grandfather clause in uh, Louisiana states that if your uh, grandfather was uh, a slave, if your grandfather could not vote because he was a slave, then that means you can't vote either. OK, and they're trying to find ways to circumvent the 15th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which guaranteed the right to vote to African-American men. If we read this article here from The Washington Post, the Mississippi plan to keep blacks from voting in 1890. We came here to exclude the Negro. This is from The Washington Post by Ronald G. Schaefer, uh, May 1st, 2021. OK, this is the month before Juneteenth becomes a federal holiday. And they talk about Solomon Saladin Calhoun, who was the white county judge who presided over the Mississippi State Convention. And he said, quote, let's tell the truth. If it bursts the bottom of the universe, we came here to exclude the Negro. We came here to exclude the Negro. Nothing short of this way. Well, uh, will answer. This is understanding systemic racism. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race. Now, delegates eventually adopted a literacy test and poll tax geared to suppress the black vote in a state with a black majority. The Mississippi plan became the model throughout the South, part of a raft of racially oppressive Jim Crow laws that ended reconstruction okay so when we have come together with these celebrations we have to tie all this history together and then tie it to where we are today to understand where we need to go from here a people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community OK, so we can't just come together and have dancing and African dance and eat watermelon and eat uh, ribs and things like this. You can do all that. I don't eat meat. You can do all that. But we have to have the historical component. We have to have the economic empowerment component. We have to have the component that teaches our people law, teaches us the U.S. Constitution, teaches us about our city charter, state constitution, et cetera. All this has to come together. And we have to understand that politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth upon resources. 9, 10 a.m. WFDF, the African History Network show. We'll be back in a few minutes. OK, stand by. Back from break in four minutes. How's everybody doing? All right. How you all like this type of information? Now, also, if for the, the online classes, if you want to pay for the online classes through Cash App, you can do that also. Our Cash App link is on the homepage of our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Uh, okay, who do we have here? We have Felicia. Okay, she asked for all the classes on uh, Saturdays. Um, the class number one is going to, is going to be on Saturday. Now, keep in mind, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You don't have to be present in class. I don't take attendance. So you can watch the class whatever day you want to watch it. And if you have questions, you can email me. 
Okay, so you can watch the class on demand. Even after the course is over with, you'll still have full access. So a year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire course. So you don't have to worry about being in class at a certain time on a certain day. I'm going to post the link again here. Um, so you can read, and we have the information on the homepage of our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Uh, but you can register for this here. Let's see here. Okay. Yeah, so this class is going to be, uh, we, we're going to start it today, but um, it, it's going to be on, on Saturday, um, June 24th. It usually doesn't work out trying to launch classes on a holiday weekend or something like that. So, yeah, it's going to be June 24th. And as soon as you register for it, this bonus content, you can start watching right now. And there's some of my lectures I've uploaded because you get five of my lectures free that will be in the video library that you can start watching. Okay, back from break and um, stand by. Back from break in two minutes, everybody. Okay, and then we have uh, Felicia said, thank you. We've got uh, Black and Honest Education, love the information. Uh, Lauren C. Ross, a uh, few minutes glance. Okay, Black Grow Than Development.com. Black Grow Than D Development.com. Um, Rainy Fox Media said exactly uh, one of my previous comments. Uh, Smitty Rock said very important and critical info for the historical background. The network shall be focused on educating and empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. A lot of people don't know what the hell they're talking about. They may have an area of expertise, but some people need to learn how to stay in their own lane. If you don't know, just say you don't know. So we have a lot to talk about, so we're going to jump right into this. Catch it all right here on 910 AM Superstation. WFDF, Farmington Hills, Detroit, 910 AM Superstation, a division of Adele Media. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 910 AM Superstation or Adele Media. Welcome back to the African History Network show. Okay, uh, I want to go back to this article quickly here from Texas Monthly from historian Peniel Joseph. Uh, the name of this article is, it deals with how uh, the story we've been told about Juneteenth is, uh, is wrong. The story we've been told uh, about Juneteenth is wrong, okay? And this is from uh, June 2023 from uh, Texas Monthly. Now, if we go back here uh, where I left off, and then I want you to hear what happened on Roland Martin Unfiltered when I was on on uh, Thursday, June 15th. Okay. So uh, a common view about Juneteenth in both black and white communities is that black folks in Galveston, Texas and around Texas were slow to hear or fully grasp the news about the civil wars end and the arrival of liberty and the arrival of liberty. Uh, this story, this is the story I was told in church, uh, historian Pino, uh, Joseph said, but that, but that's not entirely true. That's not entirely true. All right. Now, uh, some of, let's see, some portion of black Texans, especially those working in the port of Galveston, Texas, knew that the tide of the civil war had long ago turned in favor of Union troops. They'd also probably caught wind of Emancipation Proclamation, of the Emancipation Proclamation from travelers disembarking on the wharves. Further, they'd, they'd likely hear, they likely heard 
what must have seemed to be fantastical tales about regiments of black soldiers uh, in the Union Army. News of the impending freedom had almost certainly reached other parts of Texas. News of the imp uh, impending freedom had almost uncertainly reached other parts of Texas. When enslaved African Americans from the Deep South were transported to Texas, the Lone Star State, during the Civil War. Texas was a haven for white slave owners fleeing Louisiana and other areas of the Confederacy being conquered by Union troops. But the news held little practical meaning so long as the state remained under control, under Confederate control. The arrival of some 2,000 federal troops appeared to mark an end to white rule over black, uh, over black Texans. But uh, Gordon Granger's, Major General Gordon Granger's order limited and undermined the very uh, freedoms that it promised. The relationship between former masters and the enslaved would now evolve into a vague contract between employers and hired labor. Quote, the freedmen, okay, the freedmen are advised to quietly, the freedmen are advised to quietly, uh, to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages read the order but how could black texans enjoy freedom while remaining on the plantations would they be allowed to leave travel or reunite with loved loved ones were they forbidden from becoming entrepreneurs and landholders okay further african-american men and women were warned not to flock to military posts now since 1863 uh since 1863 when uh, black men were allowed to enlist in the Union Army. Its military posts have become beacons for freedmen. The sight of blue uniforms liberating secessionist territories often meant the promise of food, clothing, and reading materials. General Gordon Granger's warning that black Texans will not be supported in idleness on military posts or elsewhere was an admonishment. It was a warning suggesting that they could not rely on federal troops, whether those Texans were seeking protection, searching for news about family and friends, looking for work or in need of food. The troops were there to enforce liberation, but they would not necessarily support those trying to carve out a new life, okay? So uh, now, uh, another uh, important part here of this article is an extensive article. I don't have time to go through all of it. Uh, fears, page four. Fears among black Texans were often borne out, often came true. In the ensuing months, the beginning, uh, uh, the beginning of the period that would come to be known as Reconstruction, which is 1865 to 1877, racial violence spread especially throughout the South, racial violence spread. In one town, white Texans whipped dozens of formerly enslaved African people who celebrated the news of emancipation too enthusiastically, okay? White attacks against free uh, African Americans ranged from verbal harassment and intimidation to physical assaults and even murder. African-American Texans in Galveston and other parts of the state navigated a new landscape at times more dangerous and volatile than the one they had left behind. OK, so read the rest of this article here. We're going to clip one uh, here in just a second. We're rolling Martin unfiltered, uh, Doug. The story we've been told about Juneteenth is wrong. The story we've been told about Juneteenth is wrong. Yes, we can utilize Juneteenth as a powerful tool to educate African-Americans on this history, to deal with history, economics, law and politics, to give America a massive history lesson that it desperately needs because 
many Americans are ignorant of history. And unfortunately, some of those Americans who are ignorant of history are in the House of Representatives and in the U.S. Senate. And you have to go through them to get uh, passed in the law the policies that, that we need, okay? When we deal with repairing the damage of a legacy of slavery, what was taking place in California with the California Reparations Task Force is monumental. Uh, June 29th, June 30th, they're going to come out with their uh, recommendations. There's going to be another 500-page report or so, and it's going to deal with their recommendations as well. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and uh, visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. I have an extensive two-and-a-half-hour lecture that I've done dealing with the uh, history of Juneteenth. OK, and we go deep into it. It's a visual presentation. We go deep into it. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, my 15 lecture digital download uh, bundle of lectures I've done. African history awakens the African mind for mental death. This is a hundred fifty dollar value on sale. Seventy five dollars is in digital download format. You can start watching it now. If you want it on DVD, uh, the DVD is one hundred dollars. I think last time I checked. So we have it on DVD as well. OK. And uh, when you scroll down, it has our DVD like it's right here. This one here on Juneteenth. OK. Uh, so we have the presentation uh, on Juneteenth. Also, that's uh, ten dollars. We have that on DVD, but it's also in digital download format. So you can order that right now at the African History Network dot com. OK, so um, th Thursday, uh, June, uh, Thursday, June um, 15th, I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered and we talked about uh, this story here from the uh, Associated Press. OK, family displaced from uh, California neighborhoods seek uh, $2 billion. This deals with African-American and Latino families uh, displaced from uh, a neighborhood, uh, Section 14 in uh, Palm Springs, Florida. Okay, Section 14 of Palm Springs, Florida. And uh, a lot of people have not heard of this history. Uh, these people's homes were destroyed in the 1950s and 1960s. Families displaced from California neighborhoods uh, seek uh, seek two billion dollars. They estimate that the city of Palm Springs owes them uh, two point three uh, billion dollars. Okay, this article is from April seventeenth, twenty twenty three. Uh, let's go to uh, uh, let's go to clip number uh, one, uh, Doug. folks is considered uh, the playground of the rich but there was a time when, when black and latinos were forcibly removed from their homes in the heart of palm springs the 1950s and the 1960s now they and their descendants are suing for billions we're joined right now uh by attorney ariva martin uh, who is involved in this case. Uh, Reba, for folks who don't understand uh, Section 14, what this area is, so just explain, just set this whole thing up, uh, this particular lawsuit, uh, and what these African-American Latinos are actually uh, saying. Right, so Section 14 uh, is a one square mile area in downtown Palm Springs, California. It's finally called Section 14. It actually is a pot of land that was owned by the Aqua Caliente uh, indigenous tribe. And as Blacks and Latinos were moving into Palm Springs in the 1940s and 1950s, many Blacks escaping the South thought they were escaping Jim Crowism, moving to California, looking to find the American dream, looking to build homes, to uh, build generational wealth, to really provide a bright future for their families. Uh, they realized that California wasn't very different in many ways than the South, and there were racially restrictive covenants that prevented blacks from living on streets where whites live. There were uh, banking and financial restrictions that prevented blacks from getting loans for cars and for homes. And the indigenous tribe was the only group of people who were willing to allow African Americans and Latinos to live on their land. So black folks built a community on this plot of land, 646 acres, one square mile, uh, finally referred to as Section 14. They built homes, they built churches, they built businesses, they built a thriving community. And this is while they are working to help Palm Springs become this exotic getaway in the desert. They were working as cooks and nannies and maids and chauffeurs and carpenters and builders as Palm Springs was building itself up. 
to cater to the likes of Gene Autry, Frank Sinatra, East Football, and some of the biggest names uh, in Hollywood in the 50s and 60s. Uh, but they had a problem. Despite wanting this uh, free labor, despite wanting these African-American and Latino families to provide uh, these services, they did not want these families to be in the heart of downtown Palm Springs. They wanted them, uh, to, they wanted their labor, but they wanted them out of sight. So the city basically hatched a plan to remove the families from of this community. And they didn't use eminent domain. They didn't use a legal process. They used sheer might, sheer force. They demolished using bulldozers, the homes, and then they used the city's fire department to set the homes on fire. So they upended this very vibrant uh, black and brown community, and they buried the secret uh, essentially for 60 years. And now these families have found their voices, and they're speaking out, and they're demanding not only an apology, which was issued, but they're demanding that they receive some kind of reparative justice. Wow. But, I mean, you know, we, we, we think about uh, the, we just had the 102nd Tulsa Rape Massacre, uh, and we talk about that. Um, I never heard of this. Yeah, well, when, you know, so many folks say they didn't even know black folks lived in Palm Springs. Okay, pa pause it right there. Pause it right there, Doug. Pause it right there. We'll pick this up on the other side of the break. Okay, we'll have more information dealing with uh, Section 14 in Palm Springs and the fight for reparative justice for these African-American and Latino families. You listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel, 313-778-7600, uh, 910 AM WFDF. We'll be back in a few minutes. Okay, stand by, everybody. Okay, who still needs to register for the online class we have starting up Saturday, June 24, 2023? Saturday's 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, class number one of Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade starts up. Uh, we'll post a link here. As soon as you register, you, re you register right now for it. And you can start watching content. We have bonus content. You can start watching. And also, we have class number one that's uploaded from the previous time I taught the class. You can start watching that now. Okay. Uh, so that is at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Okay, everybody, back from break in three minutes. Stand by. Back from break in uh, two minutes. Back from breaking one minute. All right, who we have here? Post your comments here. We'll read them on the air. Okay, Joya said good evening. Okay, Motif Man said teach profit.
Back from break in one minute. Unique, I'm your host, Brother Michael in the hotel. On the African History Network show, we focus on educating the pine and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. A lot of people don't know what the hell they're talking about. They may have their areas of expertise, but some people need to learn how to stay in their own lane. If you don't know, just say you don't know. So we have a lot to talk about, so we're going to jump right into this. Catch it all right here on 910 AM Superstation. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. Okay, uh, so right before the break, we were talking about this topic and uh, this article here from uh, the Associated Press. And uh, this article is from April 17th. Uh, this article is from April 17th, uh, 2023. Families displaced from California neighborhoods seek uh, $2 billion, Okay. And this deals with um, African-American and Latino families that were displaced in the 1950s and 1960s from uh, Palm Springs, uh, California. And it's a section called Section 14, Section 14 in Palm Springs, California. Uh, and Ariva Martin uh, talked about this on uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered when I was on on Thursday uh, June 15th. If we look at this article here quickly from uh, the Associated Press, and then we'll go back to uh, the clip here. Uh, it says, let's see, uh, decades later, uh, Palm Springs, let me find my place here. Decades later, Palm Springs City Council is reckoning with those actions. And what happened was, um, they took a uh, the the city bulldozed homes um and ran people out of their homes took the land etc okay decades later palm Springs city council is reckoning with those actions voting in 2021 to issue a formal apology okay uh to to former residents for the city's role in displacing them in the 1960s from the neighborhood that many black and Mexican American families called home. But the former residents say that is not enough. The former residents say uh, that is not enough. And they actually uh, bulldozed uh, homes. They were told to vacate their homes and their homes were bulldozed. Uh, those former residents now say that the city owes them more than 2.3 billion dollars for harm caused by their displacement that would be nearly 1.2 million dollars per family the dollar amount was disclosed on uh sunday that this is back in april 2023 at a meeting attended by experts such as cheryl grills a, a member of the state's reparations task force California State Reparations Task Force studying redress proposals for African Americans. The effort in Palm Springs, California, is part of a growing push by, by, by Black families to seek compensation and other forms of restitution from local and state governments for harms they've suffered due to generations of discriminatory policies that continued long after slavery ended, that continued long after slavery ended okay so check out the rest of this article here from the associated press families displaced uh from california neighborhoods seek uh two billion dollars okay now i want to go back to uh this clip from roland martin unfiltered we were speaking with attorney ariva martin out of uh california who's an attorney for uh some of the families here uh seeking redress let's go back to this clip please they want them out of sight. So the city basically hatched a plan to remove the families from uh, this community. And they didn't use them in a domain. They didn't use a legal process. They used sheer might, sheer force. 
They demolished using bulldozers the homes, and then they used the city's fire department to set the homes on fire. So they upended this very vibrant uh, black and brown community, and they buried the secrets uh, essentially for 60 years. And now these families have found their voices, and they're speaking out, and they're demanding not only an apology, which was issued, but they're demanding that they receive some kind of reparative justice. Wow. I mean, you know, we, we, we think about uh, the, we just had the 102nd anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre, uh, and we talk about that. Um, I never heard of this. Yeah, well, you know, so many folks say they didn't even know black folks lived in Palm Springs. A lot of folks have traveled there. They've played at the golf courses. They've played at the tennis courses. They've been to the nightclubs, the swanky restaurants, the swanky resorts. And you literally can drive through Palm Springs, and you'll be driving through what was Section 14. But there's not a plaque. There's not a monument. There's nothing that evidences the tremendous contributions of black and brown folks in the building up. Uh, and the development of the city. And unfortunately, a lot of the city leaders want it to be that way. They wanted Palm Springs to be this homogeneous, white, wealthy uh, getaway. And they were able to accomplish that uh, to a certain degree. Uh, but obviously, like I said, these families have found their voices. They're speaking out. They're telling the story. To anyone who will listen, we're telling it you know, in the national media, to the national press. And we're demanding that the city recognize the contributions of these uh, brave and courageous individuals, and that they do something to address the racial trauma uh, that these survivors experience. Uh, this is uh, a statement from the city attorney of Palm Springs, Jeff Bellinger. Uh, he said the city council issued a formal apology and has set the city on a course to attempt to make amends for what happened back in the 1950s and 1960s. I have been in communication with Ms. Martin, and it is my hope that with her assistance, we can continue focusing the city's resources on that course of action rather than on, on the necessary litigation. Here's the thing, Reba, why I think this uh, is so important here. When we're having this conversation about reparations and folks are invoking slavery, critics say, well, wait a minute, you weren't directly impacted, um, mm -hmm. and so how can we now trace this back? What I have long said is that if we're talking about how to seek justice, there are black people living today, and in this case, black and Latinos, who were alive then, who were, who were forced out, who were economically impacted. Their children were economically impacted. So you have a situation uh, here where you can tie individuals directly to being forced out and how if they had stayed there, and lived there as Palm Springs became this rich enclave, multi, multi million dollar homes. I need people to understand. I was just at uh, playing in Anthony Anderson's golf tournament at Big Horn in Palm Desert. There are homes there around Big Horn that range from five to forty-five, fifty million dollars and up. And so we're talking about multiple millions of dollars that black and Latinos could have been able to sell that land for had they not been forced out. Yeah, you're, you're right on the money, Will. And we're talking about the loss of generational wealth, intergenerational wealth. And we know that the black-white wealth gap is as wide as it is today is because white folks have had an opportunity to own their homes, to build equity in their homes, and then to pass that equity down to their children. Their children have been able to draw that equity down, use it to start businesses, to make investments in the stock market, and to basically get rich and to help their you know, future generations get rich as well. We've been denied that opportunity. And you are right. Uh, this We don't have to reach back to the 1800s. We don't have to talk about slaves that none of us knew. I have living, breathing clients. The oldest is are in their 90s, but many of these clients of mine are in their 70s. They're in their 80s. They have vivid memories of what happened. They have the scars uh, from this racial terrorism, uh, racial attack. So unlike some of the reparations actions that are happening around the country, and I applaud those actions because I'm so encouraged by what we're seeing, even in places like my hometown, St. Louis, that is even considering uh, studying the history of you know racial discrimination and racial attacks uh, in Missouri. This is a case 
that is, I think, a poster child for how white folks, in particular those that you know count themselves amongst the liberal, can make good on a, a promise. As you see, that city attorney's a statement says he wants to work with us. So we want to hold him to that statement. We want to work with him too, but we want to work beyond just an apology. And we know in this country, unfortunately, we can never, never, ever come up with a dollar amount that would repay folks for the kind of racial trauma that they have experienced. But we have an imperfect civil system, and that imperfect civil system relies on money judgments, money verdicts as a way to send a message uh, and as a way to deter future conduct. So we're hoping that the city makes good on that statement that you just read from the city attorney. Okay, pause it right there, Doug. Pause it right there, Doug. Okay, we're going uh, Doug. We're gonna go to uh, clip two here in just a second. Okay, so that was Attorney Ariva Martin, um, who's out of uh, California, and I was on Ariva's show later that day. That was Thursday. Thursday, I had three media interviews. I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Then I was on uh, Ariva Martin's show, eight p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Then I was right here on 9, 10 a.m. WFDF with uh, our own Charlene Mitchell on Mind Your Business. Okay, we're going to uh, go to, uh, when we come back from the break, uh, Roland went to his panel. I was on his panel along with Dr. Greg Carr and Reese Colbert, and we, and we discussed this story that a lot of people have not heard about. And, and um, you know, in uh, 2018, April 4th, 2018, anniversary of Dr. King's assassination, a study came out, a Gallup poll, 40% of white Americans say African-Americans could be just as successful as white people if we just tried harder. No, you need to deal with repairing the damage of things like this right here. You listen to the African History Network, Sean Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Back from breaking four minutes. Stand by. Okay, back from breaking four minutes, everybody. How's everybody doing? How you all like this type of information? Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on the broadcast. Follow us on our fan page, The African History Network on Facebook. Michael M. Hotep on YouTube. I M H O T E P. Support the African History Network. This helps us keep doing the research. If you like this type of information, if you're learning anything from this broadcast, you appreciate the history that we bring to you, current events, support the African History Network as well. It's not easy to do this type of work. All right, stand by. This doesn't happen with no resources. Back from break in four minutes. Get back from breaking four minutes. Stand by. Okay. Uh, back from break in three minutes. Back from breaking two minutes. Okay, Felicia Brown Sugar said, I love this information. We don't get this kind of history lesson in school. You are correct. Okay, back from break in one minute. All right, we'll post the link here. So we in the thread of the broadcast, uh, description of the broadcast, we have the information for the online classes. And class number one starts up uh, Saturday, April 24th. As soon as you register, we have bonus content that you can start watching. 
and then the we have uh my bundle pack of um uh, my bundle pack of uh lectures in digital download format 15 lecture bundle pack african history awakens the african mind uh from mental death so you can start watching that content right now It's a hundred fifty dollar value on sale uh seventy five dollars and when you click here on the link it has a listing of um the lectures that you get welcome back to the african history network show right here on 9 10 a.m superstation wfdf welcome back to the african history network show all right visit our website the african history network.com the african history network.com my uh we have my juneteenth lecture when you scroll down the page you'll see my D uh, dvd lectures and digital downloads we have my juneteenth uh lectures a two and a half hour uh presentation i did this june 16 2021 Juneteenth history, Emancipation Day, but not Independence Day. We never got our 40 acres and a mule. Dr. King's Poor People's Campaign, we're coming to get our check. Okay, this is a two and a half hour presentation. We also have it uh, in digital download format if you want to be able to watch it right now. Uh, and then also we have uh, my uh, bundle pack of uh, lectures in digital download format. Uh, African history awakens the African mind from mental death. This is a uh, 15 uh, bundle pack, a uh, uh, 15 title bundle pack from me. And we deal with, uh, when you click on the link here, it uh, tells you all the titles in the bundle, everything. Yeah, I'm give my Black Panther lectures, including my latest one I did November 2022 on the, on the new Black Panther movie. Uh, we get uh, Malcolm X, Dr. King, uh 13 forms of wealth principles of political six principles of political self-defense ancient kemet the winter solstice and the history of christmas the double lecture i did with dr david m hotep who wrote the book the first americans were africans documented evidence redistributing the pain how african americans fought back with economic boycotts uh ancient africans in america before native americans columbus or slavery great african women in history the mothers of civilization and african-american resistance in the era of donald trump voter suppression reparations and how elections have consequences okay so uh you get those and there'll be a bonus uh because you'll get the um the lecture that i did dealing with the new black panther movie you get that also so you actually get 16 uh uh titles there okay and we'll post this right on the homepage of our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. And we'll post the link here on the thread. Okay, so I want to go back to this clip here from Roland Martin and Filtered from Thursday, June 15th, 2023. We were talking about uh, the African Americans and Latino Americans in Palm Springs, uh, California, uh, who were displaced from their homes and they're suing for $2.3 billion. It averages out about 2,000 families, it averages out to about $2,000. Uh, per family. We were speaking with attorney Ariva Martin from California. I was on her radio show, uh, Ariva Martin in real time, uh, KBLA 1580 AM, uh, Southern California, which is a type of Smiley's radio station. I was on her radio show later that evening. Uh, it, and in this clip here, Roland goes to his panel. Let's go to clip two, please, Doug. Hi, right, let's welcome to my panel, Dr. Craig Carr, Department of African American Studies at Howard University. Glad to have him out of D.C. Rishi Colbert, uh, host of the Rishi Colbert Show on Sirius XM Radio out of D.C. as well. Michael Imhotep, host of the African History Network Show out of Detroit. Uh, I want to start with you, Greg. I, I, I had never heard uh, of this story. Uh, and uh, it, it is, is a fascinating one. And again, for folks who don't know, Palm Springs, I mean, we're talking about just multiple million dollar homes there. Uh, and so this is a perfect example of, again, folks who, they're a lot more, look, you only got three de three uh, descendants of Tulsa Race Massacre. It's a lot more folks still living what's, what happened there at Palm Springs. 
No, absolutely, Roland. In fact, I spent all day today at the D.C. City Council. Um, our friend brother, Kenny McDuffie, council member at large, uh, he and Ken, uh, and, Ken, and, and brother Treon White have uh, proposed a reparations commission for the District of Columbia. And so I was one of over 100 people who testified, including Dr. Grills and also Camila Moore from the California Reparation Task Force. And one of the things that kept coming up over and over again is the dispossession of black folk in terms of their land moving. They usually use in the domain. Now, we all know how Tony, the uh, Chevy Chase uh, section of Maryland and D.C. is. Black folk used to live there. They literally moved them off of three acres of family, and they had been moved from southwest to, to, to southeast to, to northwest. Serial land dispossession. But 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 I want to ask uh, ask the lawyer there because she's working with Dr. Grill, who's on the California Reparation Task Force, and our sister Julianne Malvo. Is where does this intersect with the indigenous folk? Because the story indicates that they are the Agua Caliente Caula Indians who uh, have a reservation there, and that this could not have done been done without their participation. So I'm wondering if this is going to get tied up between the white folk who dispossessed them and the indigenous folk whose land it was, and was there collusion between them? But it's a story of dispossession, and it's unfortunately very, very common. You know, um, the point that um, Greg makes there, uh, Reese, is, is an interesting one because when you start looking at what has happened all across this country, we see what's happening with black farmers in this country. Uh, there were a lot of black people who own land who were literally forced out of cities. They fled places because they were threatened with a murder. And when you start talking about the stealing of land, this is where I think there are where our legals, our legal experts can play a critical role when it comes to uh, receiving compensation for what was stolen uh, from from black folks. This is why when people when, this is why it's interesting I, I, when people need to understand when, when you talk about repair and reparations, it's not one way of seeing it. Right. What they're doing, is they're looking, and so and again, I think people make the mistake when 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 I, I hear some of these conversations, and it's like, when is Congress going to give us our check? Well, listen, there were this case, this was actions by a city, right? By city officials that's documented, and then they could target the city. Yeah, I mean, if we look at his uh, the reparations movement in terms of where the most progress has happened, it's actually happened at the local and state levels. You have mayors that are behind it in various cities, Evanston being one of them, um, and you have California, which has made the most progress in terms of the state. But, um, you know, the way to go about this is to get litigious. The, the notion that somebody's going to bestow charity on us with legislation um, is not necessarily as feasible, at least not on the federal level, in any time soon, particularly with gerrymandering and the other political pressures that uh, both parties are under, but particularly Democrats. And so this is a really great method um, because there's evidence of participation directly from the city. This isn't about some rogue resident who uh, took, took their white supremacy too far. This was coordinated government action. And so an apology is not sufficient show me the damn money. And, you know, if that doesn't work, okay, well, then what else you got? Because there's a lot of money in Palm, in Palm Springs. There's a lot of land in Palm Springs. There's a lot of way to repair the damage that is being done. But I'm with Ariva Martin. Don't be shy about asking for money. If Greg Abbott can get money for a tree falling on him for running down the street, then, God damn it, black people can get reparations for being forced out of their homes by the city in Palm Springs. I typed therapy into my search engine and one of the Okay. Uh pause, pause, pause it right there. Uh and we're gonna pick it up at the uh we'll pick it up at the thirty one twenty mark. Um we'll pick it up at the thirty one twenty mark, uh, Doug, when you get that queued up. Now and hold on just a second, Doug, before you start it back up. Now what's important for people to understand, and this is what I said on the Reva Martin show. And this is what I said. Uh, I think I also said this on Charlene Mitchell's show as well. Uh, mind your business here on 910 AM WFDF. When we talk about repairing the damage, 
we have to shift the focus from talking about slavery because chattel slavery ended what 155 uh, 155 years ago okay we have to shift the focus from talking about slavery to focusing on present day structural inequities present day structural inequities attorney Ariva Martin just said she has people who are alive today who were victims of this discrimination their homes bulldozed ran out of their homes so we don't have to talk about the the last of the former slaves died in the 1950s we have people alive today who are victims of who have been victimized by these policies okay so if you shift the focus to present day structural inequities deal with the laws and policies that are in place that brought about the structural inequities that created these structural inequities then you can trace that back to a history of slavery reconstruction era 1865 1877 jim crow era okay and we can get a lot more accomplished much faster than just focusing the majority of our time energy and resources on trying to get reparations for slavery because let me just be honest with you if you couldn't get reparations for the former slaves while they were still alive what makes you realistically think that you're going to be able to really accomplish something 155 years after chattel slavery ended and all the former slaves died the last of them died in the 1950s i mean to really get something tangible to really get something accomplished most of the people that got that that have to vote on these policies are white let's be honest okay we'll continue this on the other side of the break list to the african history network show on michael m hotel we'll be back in a few minutes Back from break in four minutes. Back from break in four minutes. See, see, we're gonna have to be more creative and we're gonna have to be gangster when it comes to getting reparations. Just asking for reparations ain't gonna work. We're gonna have to, we're gonna have to be gangster and and when we have control of city government, things like this, we're gonna have to go in and take it. We're gonna have to be gangster with it. Just asking for hell. It, 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 Cali House and the you know the the, the reparations uh, uh, organization that Cali House headed up in the late 1890s. They tried to get a federal pension for former slaves when they were still alive, and that was denied. And Cali House was brought up on false charges in jail for a year. We're gonna have to be gangster with this. Okay, stand by. Back from break in three minutes. All right. Okay, we'll continue that clip on the other side of the break. I'm going to try to squeeze in this a little bit of this clip dealing with uh, Tyler Perry as well. Stand by. Back from break in two minutes. All right, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App and through PayPal, PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show.
Genova Dell Media. Great programming. When it's what you want, 9, 10 a.m. is what you need. I'm your host, Brother Michael in the hotel. On the After History Network show, we focus on educating the mind and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. A lot of people don't know what they have to talk about. We have the area of expertise. But some people need to learn how to stay in their own lane. If you don't know, just say you don't know. Uh, we have a lot to talk about, so we're going to jump right into this. Catch it all right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. Welcome back to the African History Network show. All right. Um, before we go back to that clip, let me show you this here. Uh, uh, well, two things. Number one, on uh, on Monday, June 19th, I will be, let's see, let's get this uh, up here on the homepage of the website. Uh, I will be out in uh, Inkster, Michigan, and I'll be at the um, the Middle Passage commemoration and the uh, Juneteenth celebration there uh, at Inkster Park. So we have the information on the homepage of our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. So when you sh uh, scroll down the homepage, uh, we have it there. So it's uh, Monday, June 19th, 11, 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. at Inkster Park, located at 1550 John Daly Road, Inkster, Michigan. It's going to be under the pavilion. It's a it's a small park, so you can't miss it under the pavilion. I speak at 7 p.m. I'll speak for about an hour. I'll take questions also. I'll deal with some of the history of Juneteenth, and we'll talk about, um, you know, um, reparations and all of that, okay? The flyer is right here, Juneteenth Middle Passage Memorial with the uh, – uh, with the African History Network's Michael M. Hotel. Uh, I'm not the organizer of it. I'm, I'm the speaker, but Crystal put me on here. Crystal Linton. Uh, she's the main organizer. Community Up Project and the National Action Network Inkst Inkster Western Wayne County Chapter. Uh, so this is at uh, Inkster Park. It's a free event. Bring the family. Uh, for more information, call 734-444-5765 or 313 Two zero seven four five two seven. We have the information right here on the homepage of our website. Okay, uh, and also I want to show you this article here. So I was talking about shifting the focus from trying to seek reparations for two hundred forty six years of slavery, shifting the focus to present day structural inequities that are very easy to see. There's overwhelming evidence to support. OK, and we have people alive who are being harmed by these structural inequities. So a quick example of that. And we'll go back to this clip. Economists who says, uh, oh, okay, um, this deals with how the U.S. E US economy has lost 16 trillion dollars, 16 trillion dollars in uh, the last uh, 20 years. OK, this was a study from. Uh, Citigroup Bank, okay, Citigroup Bank, and I want to pull up the, the main article um, that I want to go to dealing with this. It's not this one here. It's another one. Um, with $16 trillion. And it, it talks about how uh, racism has cost the U.S. economy uh, $16 trillion from the year uh, 2000 to the year 2020. Okay. This is from cbsnews.com. cbsnews.com. Racism has cost, uh, let's see, let's go here. Racism has cost the U S uh, $16 trillion city group fines. This is from September 23rd, 2020. And very quickly here, it says that America could have been $16 trillion richer if not for inequities in education, housing, wages, and business investment between black and white Americans over the past 20 years, new research concludes. Uh, this was a study done by Citigroup, okay, Citigroup Bank. The study released by Citigroup is the latest, is the latest uh, in a body of research that attempts to quantify the economic impact of systemic racism. Citigroup derived at a $16 trillion figure after estimating that black workers have lost $113 billion in potential wages over the past two decades because they could not get a college degree, 
the number one. Number two, the housing market lost $218 billion in sales because black applicants could not get home loans. Number three, thir about $13 trillion in business revenue never flowed into the economy because African-American entrepreneurs could not access bank loans. So this is showing how racism harms everyone, even though we get the brunt of it, we get the majority of it. It goes on to say, what's more, the U.S. could have $5 trillion in gross domestic product over the next five years if those gaps and others were closed today, the study indicated. So this deals with the lasting harm of a legacy of slavery and how you have to uh, deal with the laws and policies that were put in place that created these structural inequities. And it's gonna, it, it was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It will be laws and policies that get us out of it. All right, uh, let's go back to uh this clip here from Roland Martin and filter because they're about to come to me uh let's go to uh, this clip please Doug. Hey. and again the thing that i think what was important here um michael when you look at bruce beach when you look at what happened there when you look at this here the strategy here is not trying to have a macro approach to this right this is saying here we have individuals who we can identify, who exist. This happened to them. We're going to target them. Right. That's why there are mo you know again th th there are multiple strategies. When we're talking about how do how do we change the economics? I mean, I'm, I'm literally you know I don't write speeches. I'm literally was I was on the golf course and I was thinking through what, what I was going to talk about tonight uh, to uh, this group of CDFI CEOs. Uh, and, and what I was going to say to them is that we have to be thinking about this black economic ecosystem in a, in a totally different way uh, as opposed to how we are approaching it right now. Because I'm looking at buckets here, 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 and we need folks who are going after all the different buckets as opposed right. to thinking there's only one way to achieve the result. Absolutely. Uh, well, first of all, Roland, thanks for having Ariva Martin on because um, I'll be talking to her later to, uh, this evening. I'm on a radio show, uh, KBLA 1580 AM, EPM Eastern Standard Time, and we're talking about reparations. So this is a timely conversation. Uh, we have to have comprehensive reparations, as Camila Moore has said, who's the chairwoman of the uh, California Reparations Task Force. Uh, we have cars talked about as well. We, the root concept is repairing the damage of something that's been done. So we have to have comprehensive reparations. We have to have reform when it comes to the laws and policies that continue to inflict the harm upon us. We have to have cash payments as well. Uh, so, uh, so we have to understand that. This is very interesting here. I first, um, there was an article back in April 18th that came out where I first found out about this in Palm Springs. And one, one of the questions I had is when we, when we look at, for instance, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, North Tulsa, Greenwood, we know that some of the early landowners in North Tulsa got land from those Black Freedmen Indian treaties in 1866. Because Tulsa was founded by Creek Indians around 1834, and when they when they went into Oklahoma, they took the African slaves with them. So when we talk when we talk about pause, pause this right Native there. American, okay, pause it right there. We're out of time here. Uh, those watching, those watching, pause it right there. Those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. Keep watching. We'll keep going for a few more minutes. Also, we'll tell you what Governor Ron DeSantis is doing, how he defunded black history programs in the state of Florida. Visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Register for my online classes. We'll see you in Inkster, Michigan uh, on Juneteenth uh, at the park and uh register for our online classes as well R right now is correct wrong behavior it's not over till we win what kind of forever we'll talk to you next week peace okay let's uh let's keep going here stand by all right let's go back to this clip here all right here we go after all the different buckets as opposed right. to thinking there's only one way to achieve the result. 
Absolutely. Uh, well, first of all, Roland, thanks for having Ariva Martin on because um, I'll be talking to her later to, uh, this evening. I'm on a radio show, uh, KBLA 1580 AM, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we're talking about reparations. So this is a timely conversation. Uh, we have to have comprehensive reparations, as Camila Moore has said, who's the chairwoman of the uh, California Reparations Task Force, um, as Greg Carr has talked about as well. We, the root concept is repairing the damage of something that's been done. So we have to have comprehensive reparations. We have to have reform when it comes to the laws and policies that continue to inflict the harm upon us. We have to have cash payments as well. Uh, so, it, uh, so we have to understand that. This is very interesting here. I first, um, there was an article back in April 18th that came out where I first found out about this in Palm Springs. And one, one of the questions I had is when, when, we, when we look at, for instance, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, North Tulsa, Greenwood, we know that some of the early landowners in North Tulsa got land from those Black Freedmen Indian treaties of 1866 because Tulsa was founded by Creek Indians around 1834. And when they, when they went into Oklahoma, they took the African slaves with them. So when we talk when we talk about this Native American nation, the Agua Caliente band of uh, uh, Cayuhila Indians, I'm wondering, are there any treaties? Is there any intermarrying into these Native American nations as well? Uh, and we have to understand how to utilize the law at the city level, state level, and at the federal level to bring about what it is that we want, okay? This is why it's not just about voting. Voting strategically is very important, and we vote for power. We don't vote for exercise, okay? You don't, so we have to stop telling African Americans to exercise your right to vote. We vote for power. If you want to exercise, you go to the gym. But we also have to understand law, because politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources. So all this comes together. So this is a, a very timely conversation, Roland. Uh, okay. Folks, hold tight one second. All right. So that was uh, from Roland Martin and Filter. That was uh, Thursday, uh, June 15th, 2023. You can check that out at uh, Roland Martin's YouTube channel and uh, on his Facebook page as well. We'll have uh, we'll have that clip on my YouTube channel uh, as well, Michael M. Hotep. All right, now, uh, let's see here. Okay, now I wanna go to this, uh, squeeze in this next story here. So, uh, there were memes floating around on social media saying that uh, Tyler Perry uh, bought BET. You probably saw memes uh, this past week uh, saying that. Unfortunately, uh, there was not a lot of uh, evidence that was cited by those memes on social media. And uh, there's a lack of evidence. Even when you read uh, these numerous articles, these numerous articles that um, we're floating around. Okay. So I, I saw so much um, misinformation floating around. I saw, and I was really upset with blackenterprise.com uh, when they posted this misinformation. I was upset with Ebony uh, Magazine. I commented on Ebony's um, Instagram page. They posted uh, a picture of Tyler Perry and said he bought BET. They cited no sources, no evidence. And we have to do a better job in, in, in African-American-owned media, especially. We have to do a better job. You can't just jump on a viral story. You have to research it. I know you're trying to get the advertising dollars and trying to get the clicks and things like this. But, um, you know, I, I did a, a short video breaking this misinformation down. And uh, here's a clip of that video. It's on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep. Um, let's go to this clip here. So I wanted to come on for a few minutes. I want to deal with this story that's gone viral. And this is an example of why we need to be critical of what we read, why we need to read the entire articles, why Facebook memes are not evidence, why social media memes are not evidence. Okay. So many, many of you have seen the memes floating around and the articles floating around on social media 
about uh, alleging that Tyler Perry, Tyler Perry, Medea, Tyler Perry, uh, House of Pain and Sisters, um, entertainment mogul Tyler Perry bought BET and VH1. All right. Now, I posted an article. Uh, I, I posted a um, uh, a meme on my uh, Facebook page, uh, my personal Facebook page, Michael M. Hotel, and on my fan page, the African History Network. Okay. And here's here's what I said. Some media outlets are reporting that Tyler Perry bought BET, but as a, but as of five ten p.m. Eastern Standard Time on June thirteenth, twenty twenty three. He hasn't posted anything on Facebook or Instagram, okay, saying this. All right, now, uh, I did that two days ago, and I also posted that on uh, my personal uh, Facebook page as well, um, Michael M. Hotel, and a lot of people started responding. Now, I, I just went to Tyler Perry's uh, Facebook page, and I just looked at his uh, Instagram page as well, okay? And so if we look at this here, I'm going to show it to you. Tyler Perry on Facebook. He has 15 million followers on Facebook. This is Tyler Perry's official uh, Facebook page. When you look at his official Facebook page, which is Tyler Perry, he has 15 million followers, not 15 or 1,500. Tyler Perry, June 12th, he posted 1.25 p.m., okay? He has nothing on his Facebook page saying he purchased BET, or that he purchased VH1, okay? Then when you go to Tyler Perry's official uh, Instagram page, all right, you see uh, the same thing. So I'm going to pull up his official Instagram page as well, and I'm going to uh, deal with how a little bit of how this rumor got started. Because what happened was there was a uh, article from an obscure um, website, news outlet called streamer.com, okay? And all these different news outlets started citing this one source, this one article from streamer.com. Streamer.com took down the article saying that Tyler Perry bought BET and VH1. Now this is Tyler Perry's official Instagram page, okay? He has 7.3 million followers on Instagram. When we scroll down, okay, we look at his entries. He has nothing on here saying he bought BET and VH1, okay? So the first thing that you do when you hear a news story saying a celebrity did this and that, the first thing you do, go to their social media platforms because they'll post a press release on their social media platforms. They'll post a Instagram video, Twitter video, Facebook video, whatever to inform you about what it is. When you look at these stories that are floating around, now news1.com did a really good story that breaks down all this false information floating around. So we're gonna, we're gonna look at this article from news1.com, okay? Because I was going back and forth with people on social media. I've been in media 13 years, okay? I'm the host of the African History Network show, founder of the African History Network. You see me on Roller Martin Unfiltered. I, I, I'm doing three media hits today. I was on Roller Martin Unfiltered today, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. I just finished doing a Reba Martin's uh, radio show, 15, uh, 1580 KBLA out of Southern California. That's Tavis Smiley's radio station. And then I'm doing Charlene Mitchell's show, 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here in Detroit, 9, 10 a.m. WFDF, 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation WFDF, which is the radio station my radio show was on, Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, conflicting reports about Tyler Perry purchasing BET go viral, okay? And let me stop this video here. All right, now, here's what happened, right? Now, this is a really good article, minus the ads, uh, from... Um, from news1.com. Okay, now earlier this year, earlier 2023, uh, we know Tyler Perry expressed interest in purchasing a majority stake in BET Media from Paramount Global. There was a good article from Forbes.com that talked about this, and we shared this on the African History Network show. All right, now, anyway, fast forward a few months, and it appears that Perry's bid to own BET became a reality 
Uh, but then it goes through. Now, it cites these different memes, these different uh, social media posts, okay? Only maybe not just yet. While numerous, let's zoom in on this here, everybody. It's important for everybody to have a critical eye because we're about to go into a pre we're about to go into a presidential election cycle, where now you have artificial intelligence, where now you're going to have more fake information out there than ever. And if we can't spot something that's easy to spot like this, how are we going to spot other things that are more deceptive that can have a catastrophic uh, result? when when we buy into the misinformation now news1.com says while numerous publications have reported that the deal to grant ownership of bet has been finalized it appears those publications may have been spreading the news taken from a single source a single source the streamer s-t-r-e-a-m-r the streamer or streamer.com, which apparently has since taken down its report on the matter. Now they have a link here. Um, and then this link takes you to another uh, article that cites some of the same information, but doesn't verify anything, doesn't uh, uh, have any quotes, doesn't talk to Tyler Perry, doesn't talk to Tyler Perry's manager, doesn't talk to Tyler Perry's uh, attorney, his business manager, his publicist, his chauffeur, his valet, nothing, okay? There's been no statements from BET, attorneys for BET, a publicist for BET, I went to BET's website, nothing, okay? So all these different, all these different outlets, hold on just a second here, I hit the wrong button, okay? All these different outlets were citing all these different outlets were citing uh, a single news source from streamer.com and streamer has taken down their articles. So when you see these different articles go, uh, first of all, I've been in media 13 years. When I read articles, I always go and click on the links and look at the source article, look at the source information. Where did this come from? Okay. Is this a source that says, and people are unnamed? Is this a direct quote from somebody that has knowledge of what's going on? Is this, is this a direct quote from the subject of the article? All right. Now, uh, so Philip Lewis uh, posted June 13th, 2023, just FYI, the original report on this Tyler Perry BET news has been taken down, okay? Then we look, uh, he said, I saw this report today and decided to hold off on sharing because I've never heard of this site, streamer.com, and I haven't heard of streamer.com either, okay? I never heard of this site, streamer.com. It's always worth waiting uh, for another report or two to confirm. There has been no confirmation since the article from streamer.com. Suffice it to say this update has called, now news1.com goes on to say, suffice it to say this update has caused uh black twitter to go from celebrating the news of tyler perry's finalized purchase to waiting around in black excellence limbo to find out if the news is actually true or not okay jasmine brand uh posted on twitter uh reports th uh, that tyler perry finalized a deal to acquire bet may have been premature the streamer reported yesterday that tyler perry agreed to purchase bet from parent company paramount global for an undisclosed figure Okay, undisclosed figure, cite no sources, don't cite anybody that's involved in the deal, don't cite anybody that works for any of the companies involved in the deal, okay? So this is how a lot of this viral content gets started, okay? Then you, then you, had, this, then you had this meme here and they have the BET logo and things like this. Uh, one take news. Tyler Perry has reportedly taken full control of BET. Really? What source are you citing? Citing the streamer.com. That source has been taken down. Okay. Uh, we look uh, uh, here. I know Karen Hunter. We've been on Roland Martin Unfiltered before. She uh, tweeted this here. Seems like it was reported too soon. Mark, uh, Mark LaHall said. That's why I didn't report this stuff. One of the people I checked with is, is Roland. Roland knows all these people. 
okay so roland is going to be one of the first people i check with then i also check with my girl nikki rich because nikki rich is uh interviews all these uh celebrities i'll check with nikki rich but one the first place i look at is the the social media platform of the people that the stories are being written about okay um uh, so go through all these different articles popping up you're going to see that as of june 15th 2023 they're basically all citing the same source okay now there was one video of uh like this this meme right here tyler perry set the uh, uh acquire bet they cited stream uh streamer entertainment all right now there was a video of uh kiki palmer okay kiki palmer akila and the b kiki palmer was in one of the medea movies uh you know with tyler perry kiki palmer congratulates tyler perry kiki palmer in the video on her instagram page i think it was her instagram page she didn't say how she found out how she confirmed the deal she just congratulated him that video goes viral she didn't say how she confirmed the deal she didn't say who she talked to anything like this there was a there was a a a, a post on rolanda watts uh former talk show host you know rolanda watts i think on her facebook page and she congratulated her dear friend tyler perry things like this on the purchase of bt rolanda didn't say how she confirmed it she just posted a picture of her and tyler i'm not saying she was trying to do something disingenuous but she didn't say how she confirmed the news she didn't say that she did confirm the news she was just congratulating her friend tyler perry on the purchase of bet but there was no evidence that she confirmed anything okay once again i'm not saying she was trying to do something disingenuous or anything like that but we, we have to be we have to be more careful especially in this age where there's so much access to information and so many fools out here at the same time okay all right so check out this article here from news1.com we have to look at this information with a critical eye conflicting reports about tyler perry purchasing bet go viral there was an article from fox 5 atlanta as well i think it was because now more of these articles are starting to question well wait a second the source the main source i saw black enterprise posted an article about this black enterprise.com i saw ebony i had the ebony on on their instagram page they posted this i had to ask the question how did you verify this information who did you talk to i'm still waiting on some of those outlets to, to get back with me and tell me who did you verify because one of the things that you see with these memes and this is why it's so important to look at this with a critical eye these facebook memes these memes on instagram will make a statement and cite absolutely no sources don't tell you where the information came from it's the same thing with a, with a lot of these means when we go back to this article a lot of these means floating around saying tyler perry bought bet now he may eventually buy bet we may find out next week that he closed the deal as of yet he hasn't said anything so who the hell's talking I don't think anybody who's in the room is talking. BET is not talking. Tyler Perry isn't talking. So where's this coming from? One of the uh when you look at these different like like this one right here, Culture Central. Culture Central. Now this was a popular meme, okay? This was a popular post. This was on Twitter. They all show pictures of Tyler Perry, okay? For the first time in 21 years. Now this people were taking th th this caption and circulate people doing TikTok videos, all this. They didn't cite one source, or they'll cite the source from streamer that's been taken down. For the first time in 21 years, BET is black owned again. For the first time ever, VH1 is now black owned. Tyler Perry just made history as the first African American to buy two major television networks. Okay. Okay. Now, this has been like 27,000 times, 539 replies how the hell did they verify this information absolutely no media source here notice they ain't even tag tyler perry in here he's on twitter they didn't tag tyler perry in this post why not 
All right, so we're going to pause it there. You can watch the rest of that at our YouTube channel, uh, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. It's also on my Facebook fan page, but I think you get the point. Okay, we have to be more critical and don't fall for the banana in the tailpipe. All right, now, uh, lastly, uh, there's this article here that we posted from uh, news1.com. New, uh, another article from news1.com and we know news1.com is owned by uh, Kathy Hughes um, this deals with uh, Ron DeSantis okay this deals with Ron DeSantis down in Florida ahead of Juneteenth Ron DeSantis slashes funding let's pull this up here Ron DeSantis slashes funding for uh, black history programs and let's see uh, okay. Ron DeSantis slashes funding for black history programs in Florida. All right. Uh, and let me pull up the, I want to get up the heading for this also. So just a second here. Can we flip over? Okay, we're back. All right. Okay, we're back. So we know uh, Governor Ron DeSantis is running for president of the United States. We know he is inflicting cruelty among African Americans to score uh, political points. And he's trying to do this to, uh, well, he was already doing it before he. Um, for president he's just a white supremacist this is his nature okay that's just who he is but if we look at this article here from uh, news1.com ahead of juneteenth ron DeSantis slashes funding for uh slashes funding for black history programs in florida he also vetoed five million dollars in funding that was secured for anti-gun violence programs by state democrats this is from June 17, 2021. All right, now, uh, let's see. It talks about how, according to Tampa Bay Times, Ron DeSantis cut about $510 million from uh, a budget of $117 billion, which was approved unanimously by the state legislature approved unanimously by the state legislature ultimately what ron DeSantis cut according to uh a re, a, what he cut regarding black history programs was only a tiny fraction but that does beg the question why cut it at all the tampa bay times reported the governor eliminated one hundred and sixty thousand dollars in funding for a Black History Month celebration in Orlando, Florida, called the 1619 Fest. The 1619 Fest. Well, we know Ron DeSantis and a lot of these other conservatives are against the 1619 Project. And uh, they're passing laws to suppress the teaching of, the, uh, of, Af uh, of various types of African-American history uh, in schools and uh, also passing laws saying that uh, it's illegal to teach uh, something that causes children to uh, feel uncomfortable. Mainly they're talking about white children, okay? So uh, celebration in Orlando called the 1619 Fest 
whose theme this year was to bring awareness, uh, bring awareness to health disparities that black people face in America. Governor Ron DeSatan also cut $200,000 in funding for Florida's Black Music Legacy, a project designed to highlight the state's contributions to Black music. Now, in last year, in 2022, Ron DeSantis vetoed $1 million for Valencia College to create a film, uh, to create a feature film about the 1920 Okoye Election Day Massacre, the Okoye Massacre, November 2nd, 1920. This is, see, this is the power that a governor has. This is why we cannot let these, these white supremacists who have anti-black, anti-African policies get into positions of power. In 2022, Ron DeSantis vetoed $1 million for Valencia College to create a feature film about the 1920 Okoye Election Day Massacre in which a white mob attacked and killed dozens of African-American voters in the nation's worst instance of Election Day violence. I wonder why he doesn't want people to find out, especially African-Americans, to find out what the hell happened in, in racist Florida. I wonder why Ron DeSantis, maybe that will cause people, maybe that will cause more African-Americans to vote these Republicans out of office. If they knew about the Okoy massacre of November 2nd, 1920, and the day before that was on election day, November 2nd, 1920, that was on election day. And the day before the election, the Ku Klux Klan drives through the African-American community there in Okoy, Florida, and over a bullhorn threatens them with violence if they show up to vote at the polls. I wonder why Governor Ron DeSantis doesn't want the word to get out about what happened in Florida and how African-Americans were terrorized with domestic terrorism to keep us from voting. Of course, the governor who has proved numerous times that he would declare war on any initiatives that get his anti-woke uh, 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 Spidey senses tingling, cut funding for an event that includes the 16, 1619 in his name, despite the theme of, of, of the event not apparently having anything to do with Nicole Hannah Jones Pulitzer Prize winning uh, work, the 1619 project, which is based. Uh, okay. Now, it's also not terribly surprising that Ron DeSantis would cut funding to uh, basic black history education, such as programs celebrating black music and films uh, about massacres of black people by racist white people, okay? Read the rest of this article. Now, Ron DeSantis also vetoed $5 million in funding that have been secured by state Democrats for groups, for groups working to prevent community gun violence, while, quote, GOP lawmakers pushed forward a law allowing gun owners to carry concealed weapons without a permit, according to the Tampa Bay Times. So this would also ad address some of the gun violence in the African-American community, working uh, groups working to prevent community gun violence. OK, this would also. Funding going towards groups that work in the African-American community as well, Latino communities, things like this. He vetoed that. At the same time, GOP lawmakers pushed forward a law allowing gun owners to carry concealed weapons without a permit. Read the rest of this article here. This is why fools like Ron DeSantis have to be stopped and voted out of office. Ahead of Juneteenth, Ron DeSantis slashes funding for black history programs in Florida. And we can never let people like this become president of the United States. They're too dangerous. And they overwhelmingly support, they will overwhelmingly vote against policies that are beneficial to African-Americans. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Uh, you can, if you like this type of information, if you learn anything from today's show, you can support us, $5, 10, 15, 25, 50, $100. 
dollar sign the ahn show through cash app dollar sign the ahn show through cash app also through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show and through paypal you can set it up for a recurring monthly donation i think you can do the same thing on cash app as well and we have the information on the home page of our website uh also the african history network.com the african history network.com so when you scroll down the page we have the information for our radio show um on 9 10 a.m wfdf we broadcast on facebook and youtube we have the uh, paypal cash app information here as well there's an official cash app account dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w and you click on the cash app link and it shows uh has our qr code here and then scroll down and we have the information for um uh, our 12 week online course that i teach you can register right now for it and start watching content then you can join us live in class uh saturday june 24th 2023 2 p.m to 4 p.m eastern standard time if you can't join us live that's not a problem as soon as we finish the class it's available uh to uh to what you it's available on demand watch the replay about 10 minutes after class is over with you can go back and watch the replay even after the 12 week online course is over with you can still go back and watch the entire class a year from now two years from now you can watch the entire course okay all right we have to get out of here remember right now is correct wrong behavior it's not over till we win we're kind of forever and we'll talk to you next week peace